Well, I'm very excited about this panel. Um, we, uh, this topic of uh, diversity in the boardroom is something that's been very front and center in the, in the press. Um, between institutional investor pressure, between legislation that's been uh, suggested and uh, has passed in California. We'll see if it stands up to regulatory scrutiny. Uh, but there's so much, so much discussion about uh, uh, diversity in the boardroom, and particularly women and, and people of color. Um, what, we are, what we are seeing in our work, um, I do uh, board and executive placement. And within the board uh, context, uh, we are seeing in increasing pressure from our, uh, from our clients to add diversity to the board. It's, it's both diversity in traditional context, diversity of thought, but it's something that is really front and center in almost everything we're doing. Now, what we hear from, from people in the marketplace is there's a lot of talk, but not a lot of action, and I think the truth is, is really somewhere in the middle. Um, I thought I would re uh, read you some recent statistics. We put out a publication every year, which we call the Board Monitor. Um, and uh, last year, 40% of all new seats were filled by women, up from 38.3% in 2017. 60% um, of new seats were filled by current or former CEOs. 68% uh, um, had international market experience. 23% uh, were filled by ethnic minorities, and that was up uh, from 10 years ago at 14%. So there's certainly been progress. There's certainly more progress to be made. Um, what we want to make this panel um, about is, is really the, me the mechanics and the how-to and, um, and, and how, if you're interested in being on boards, what you should be thinking about now for those of you who may be ready now, may be ready in the future. So this is very much a panel that's going to focus on those kinds of issues. Um, I won't read the bios. We've got good bios on everybody uh, in, the, in the book. We'd rather really leave it to the discussion. Uh, what we thought we would do is have a, um, a throw out a few questions and then open it up for, for Q&A from the audience, maybe 15 minutes in. So please be prepared to get your questions um, out to us. So let me start with, with this. Um, uh, we thought we would ask each uh, panelist to start with how they got on their first board, because that's often the question that people want to know, how did this happen for you? Uh, so let me, let me turn it to you, Adrian, to talk about your, your career and how you got on your first board. Thanks, Lee, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. My story really begins um, when I think about the fact that I started my career as a shift supervisor in a manufacturing plant. Uh, over 30 years, I worked for two companies, Corning and Honeywell, and, um, and over the first seven, eight, nine years, my career went very fast. I moved from job to job to job, and then um, I had my first GM experience and realized how much I loved business and that I needed to go get an MBA. And fortunately, a mentor uh, supported me in going to the Sloan Fellows Program, yay. <laughs> and, um, and I think um, as a part of that program, when we're starting to deal with more executives, it really gave me an insight on who I could be and what I could achieve in my career. So I went on to run larger businesses and larger businesses. I left Corning after 20 years and joined Allied Signal, which quickly became Honeywell, running uh, businesses in different markets and increasing responsibility until I was running one of the four groups of Honeywell. So I got to see the board really from the inside as an executive of the company. But the first notion of joining a board happened when I was still at Corning in 1999. There was a company that was looking to begin their pipeline for new board members so that when opportunities came up, they would already have someone identified. Well, that company got acquired, so, so much for that effort. But over those years, what happened was I was getting calls from recruiters, but I was in a new job and I didn't have the wherewithal and the capacity to take on a board opportunity. Well, another call would come, well, I'd just been, been appointed to another role. And when I became a corporate officer at Honeywell, our CEO did not want us to focus on someone else's stock price. <laughs> so that became off. And I said, well, keep me in your database, but I, I, I can't. 
Um, when I left Honeywell, because I was ready to um, become a free agent and figure out what I wanted to do with this next segment of my career, when I interviewed and, and was narrowing down on opportunities, I asked the CEO, are you open to me serving on a public company board? And I was not going to take an opportunity that didn't open up that avenue for me. And he said, not only do I support it, I just have two requests. One, give me a year, because I want you to focus here. But number two, I'll help you, and I'll be supportive of you finding that right board. And so he became an unofficial board buddy for me. <laughs> um, it took still a couple of more years. I joined the board of Harman, which was in the automotive industry. I had been in automotive. I'd run global, uh, technology-driven businesses. And what I found was it was a perfect fit. But that was not the first opportunity that had come forward. Another of my board buddies had um, said, you know, reach out to me when those opportunities come. And the first one that came up that I was really excited about, I went to my board buddy, he said, no, do not take that job that does not fit your background, your experience, and does not maximize what you could contribute to a board. And I learned something in that. Don't get so excited about a board opportunity that you take something that's outside of your core. And as I've served on boards, I've found that to be such an important attribute. Harmon was sold to uh, Samsung, and at the same time here, I'm worried. I got my first board, but now I'm ready for others. What's going to happen? And I've got to put myself back out there. Well, lo and behold, the stars and moon align. I got um, tapped to uh, interview for Allergan. Uh, I loved what I saw in the leadership team and the culture of that company. I joined that board, and after that, two more opened up, one at eBay and the other at Raytheon. Currently, Raytheon is being uh, merged with United Technologies, mm -hmm. and Allergan is being acquired by AbbVie. So your board world can be an <laughs> yeah, evolving one. Very so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that <laughs> okay. to you, Ruby. All right. Thank you. Well, I got on my first board in 2006, and my uh, roles prior to that had always been in line P&L management. So, uh, you know, I was managing divisions, not even at the SVP or anything role. I was president of a division. And, um, and for those of you in line positions, you know what that's like. I mean, you are buried, right? You're, you're worried about delivering the quarter or the year. You're worried about good markets and bad markets. And uh, you and your teams are just consumed. It's, it's a very immersive experience, you know, narrow but immersive. Um, and and um, I don't know whether the word board had crossed my, you know, my, my vision at that point. Uh, the thing that, that made a change for me is in 2005, um, I got the opportunity to, to take on a different role as a, short, as a two to three year assignment. Um, and it, they approached me with a role because this company was, uh, was looking to to grow again after, after some years of restructuring, and they wanted to get someone who could think about the front end, marketing, sales, et cetera. Uh, they had been looking outside, but uh, they approached me at some point because, as they said, it's, uh, you don't have a whole lot of marketing experience, but you've done it before, and you're, so it's better the blind leading the blind. You know, I had, I had some sense of vision. You know, it's interesting to some of the previous conversations about taking risks. risks I fought the change. Uh, because I was afraid of coming out of the PL line, um, you know, kind of, kind of uh, uh, race forward. But uh, the thing that made up my mind is I had a one year old daughter and I was traveling like crazy and I knew something had to give to the previous uh, conversation. So I did take the opportunity and it turned out to be fantastic for a number of reasons. It was the first time I had the chance to just come out of that deep detail of the daily PL life and be able to think at 30,000 feet. And it was a particularly unique time for this company because they, they were merging with a much larger company and that was forcing a rethink of strategy, mission, branding, go to market. And I was able to be there for those discussions, participate in those discussions, and, and influence at, that, at the corporate level. And I found that I really liked it. I enjoyed it. Now, I did know that I wanted to go back in the PL, um, uh, back into PL roles. But when things got calm in 2006, I thought about how I could maintain that, you know, that ability to, to work on strategy or participate in strategy and 30,000 foot thinking. 
and the thought of boards uh, was suggested to me. I talked to my boss, who at that time was the chief operating officer of the company, today he's the CEO, and he was someone who was a mentor to all his direct reports, and he encouraged that. Um, it made some intros for me to recruiters, I knew some recruiters, and over the course of several months, um, I, at the same time, strangely enough, two opportunities came up. And to Adrian's point, it is important to think hard about what works. One was actually a bigger name, probably a more famous company, big in the respect, you know, at that time nobody was offering me $30 billion companies, but under $5 billion, you know, a bigger name. But the other one was interesting because it was a new CEO and he was just looking for fresh en blood and fresh energy and he was very energetic. And also, something I may come back to over and over again, he had needs for skills. I think Steve this morning talked about you know, coming up with a, a skills analysis. That's very important uh, because A, it forces the company to understand what they don't have and they need and it allows you to understand if you're bringing some of that. He was looking for international experience. He was looking for commercial go-to-market experience. And I felt that I could bring value right away. And again, I was nervous. I was not, at that time, I was in my mid-40s. And, um, you know, and I was a division president. I mean, I was on a, this was a small board, seven to eight people. Four, four of them were either sitting CEOs or retired CEOs. I was going to be low man on the pole uh, in that room. So it really was important to me to have credibility uh, it was a great experience. We'll talk more about it being a learning experience later, but, uh, but that's how I got my first board. <laughs> great. And it's a great privilege to be with you today. Um, my, my first board experience uh, was really presenting to the Perkin Elmer board, and it was a, an interesting switch in roles, uh, similar to what Ru Ruby described, where I was head of business development and strategy, and we were doing this the largest acquisition uh, that they had done, and so I was pitching to the board as a staff member you know, the deal and the synergies and everything that was going to happen. And uh, the meeting ended and I walked out and the CEO said, I want you to go and run the division that you just pitched. <laughs> and, and so this is my, you know, shift from staff to line. So the next time I saw that board, it was, uh, Stephen, where are your numbers? Where are those synergies you were talking about? Where, you know, so it was... Uh, <laughs> Enough for the great thought. <laughs> it was a, a, a definitely a wake-up call. Um, and, but the first board I was on was a, a, a venture-backed startup called U.S. Genomics. I was recruited as the CEO and put on the board um, at the same time. And then uh, the second one was another venture-backed company that I was not in management, Bioprocessors, um, MDS, which was a New York Stock Exchange company. And again, on that board because I was the CEO, um, then Sensionics, I joined it when it was a venture capital back board, and it's now a publicly traded company, so it went through that transition from ZVC back to venture capital. Uh, Crane Currency was private equity backed. Um, I'm on a board of a company called Big Ass Fans. Um, it's a uh, yeah, thank you. Um, it, it's the company that makes these enormous fans. They like have 24 foot diameter. You see them a lot of times in in um, airports and stuff, and, and it was the, the uh, high volume, low velocity fan company. And then some customers said, man, that's a big ass fan. And they're like, okay. And they grabbed it, and uh, it, it, the branding works for them. And uh, now, most recently, Creation Technologies, uh, where I've just set up uh, kind of a new board. Uh, and again, that's private equity backed. And so, um, well, besides that, I also sit on the Sloan Executive Board with, with, uh, with Ruby. Um, and, uh, and the Sloan Annual Fund Board and the Sloan Alumni. So I, I sort of a little, little I, I was thinking about this, writing it up for this, an odd mix, I'm going to say odd mix of venture capital back, private equity back, public, and uh, not for profit. And so sort of seen, seen the different pieces of it. And I echo the comments that I've heard already uh, this morning because I think a, a lot of what we're going to talk about is probably rate your pitch. In other words, prepare yourself to be ready but then be patient to make sure the first experience is the right experience by getting that correct match and, and, a, and the right environment for you to kind of launch it. Great. So when people come to see me because they're looking to get on a board, um, you know, one of the first things I'll ask is, well, why do you want to be on a board? Because it does take a lot of time. You know, you do have, um, you know, uh, reputational and uh, litigation risk by doing so. So I think it, it speaks to the importance of being very careful about considering why you want to do this and what's the right board for you, which all of you have, have talked about. But can you 
uh, elaborate a little bit on that? I mean, what, from the positive side, why did you want to do it? What had you gotten out of it? And then what have been your surprises? I guess I can jump in. Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, as I mentioned before, it allowed me to think to be exposed to you know higher level issues, strategic issues. But I do think it helped me and developed me even when I went back in the line progression, because again, you had been exposed to the kinds of things that the CEO of the company is thinking about or the board is thinking about. I felt that I gained in savvy. Uh, in, in terms of just having seen some stuff that my peers weren't seeing. Was it immediately useful? Maybe, maybe not, but I think it informs your thinking and prison and communication, and so that was, that was really useful. And by the way, it create, starts to create networks, as I said, for the folks at that first board were CEOs or uh, current or retired, and uh, it's just good to know those kinds of people. Well, I would say, um, as you're thinking about a board, you should think about not only what you're going to be able to give to the board, but to your point, what are you going to get back from that board? You want an organization that you respect, you see the culture, you see the challenges, you see the opportunities, and you should be able to take something back and give it to your core organization. So I think that's one of the real cores um, uh, about you know, what, what should it be for you and what you should be for it. Um, and so that was my mindset of going in. I felt like I had an amazing um, set of career experiences that, you know, that I could step back and, and offer perspective uh, from a different voice, from a, from a diverse person who may not see things like uh, other board members would necessarily see. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wanted to make a difference. Yeah, I, I think for me, um, is sort of two, two pieces. One is I just find it's important for development and learning. And so I think for anyone who's in a leadership role in a, in a global company, it's good to spend time in the boardroom, it's good to spend time on the factory floor. And to force yourself to be jumping between those yeah. uh, groups as, as often as you can, because you'll, you'll just develop insights that you won't get if you uh, sit in a cozy middle, right? And so for me, it's fortunate, by the way, my background is I'm more comfortable on the factory floor than I was in a boardroom, right? That The boardroom was definitely learning for me uh, during my career. And then I, I think the second thing is, you gotta do it because you wanna make an impact, right? Uh, you can't, like, it, it can't be about the money or the prestige or you know, the business card. And, and making an impact is important. I, I've talked to people who've talked to me about joining a board and I said, no, I think I'm the wrong person. Let me tell you who I think the right person is. You know, based on what the board is trying to do, it doesn't make sense to me that I would be the right candidate. And so finding those places, and I would say definitely early on your first board, stick to your knitting. Right? You want to be somewhere in your industry, in your area of functional expertise, in your geography, where you can come in and kind of have immediate impact. Because otherwise, over time, you just won't find it fulfilling. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Well, what, what kind of diligence should one do if you're lucky enough to be approached um, by a public company board, um, you know, what should you be doing and how should you, you've alluded to, Steve, be, being within your wheelhouse somewhere where you can have an impact, but how, how can you really decide what makes sense? Yeah, so, so I think, um, first of all, joining a board or just taking a new role in a company, my attitude is you should be doing 10 times as much diligence on them as they're doing on you, mm -hmm. right? And so if you don't, have friends who are in the large recruiting firms, you now do, um, they have incredible databases. And so, you know, call somebody, one of the top recruiting firms and say, give me the name of three people who just left that company. And just cold call them and say, listen, I'm being considered for a position, I would talk about, you get someone who just left the company, you're gonna, you're gonna get a biased view, but you're gonna get a very, you know, kind of clear view uh, on what's going on. And, and the same kind of in the boardroom. Get a hold of the board books. Right, say, can I see some previous board books? Can you tell me what were the agenda items? What were you discussing at the last strategy session? And be able to, you know, in my mind, link that to what you're doing. Uh, when you look at board books and you see they've discussed the same topics for 18 months and they can't make a decision, <laughs> be leery about, you know, joining that board, right? Mm -hmm. and, and how effective that they're being, right? And so I think there's a couple of, uh, things that you can do as you really research it. And some of the things, um, I, Steve was up here before from, uh, 
who I, I met Steve in the gym. We, we both have an apartment in the same building I went down. He was wearing an MIT Sloan sweatshirt <laughs> about a month ago. Um, uh, Steve, you know, talked about, you know, my company, how we stand against our peers, how we compare against the S&P 500, how, like all that benchmarking. Do all of that. Right? Understand if you're joining an overperforming company or an underperforming company. Doesn't mean you don't join an underperforming company. But if it's an underperforming company who's very happy with where they are, be careful. <laughs> right. And how about the culture of the board? Because that's such an important factor, and it's sometimes hard to figure out from the outside. It could be dynamics within the boardroom, dynamics between the CEO and the board. Um, you know, any thoughts on any thoughts on those issues? Well, I would add to that um, when you're doing this diligence that that Stephen talked about. It's amazing when you start to look at the backgrounds of the existing board members and the CEO. Look at their affiliations and see if you can define someone that you know in your circle that may know them. Mm -hmm. And follow up and give them a phone call. Get that sense of who is that person. Also look on Glassdoor at the CEO's ratings and I read the comments to really get a sense of, you know, just from my investigation, what can I find out? And then I look deeply into articles about the company and, and try to get a sense because if the CEO has been in, you know, let's say a situation where he's been very vocal and there's been, you know, back and forward, that stuff translates into the, what the company dynamics are in that boardroom. And there were boards where I decided that that was really not an area that I was interested in going into because there were huge dynamics. And while they were trying to switch the board, it's my choice whether I want to go into that environment or not. So just be prepared and understand how those broader dynamics are likely to be playing out in the boardroom and make your choice. And just to add to that, I agree completely. It's so important to understand the culture and the dynamics, because it's important for any board candidate, but it's almost more important for women. Uh, because you might be a minority on the board, you know, you might be the one or the two or the one of the three, and uh, not understanding those dynamics can sink you if they are, are dysfunctional. Uh, quick thoughts, just to add to what Adrian and Steve said. You know, some of the questions you asked during the interviews, let's say you can't get a hold of the board books, but asking about the decision-making process and mm -hmm. asking several board members about that. You know, how are decisions made? What if there are disagreements? What if people aren't agreeing? You know, what, how does the CEO play into decision-making? How does the CEO play into presenting his point of view? So you keep it sort of high level, but you try to get a sense of dynamics. And, um, and one other thing, should the process uh, progress, at some point, you know, the, the power thing changes a little bit and you can make requests. So for example, if you haven't met all the board members, you can ask to meet all the board members or you can ask, for, uh, ask to meet some of the, you know, the CFO or some of the key uh, executive members. So it, again, it's, you have to do this carefully because once you're that far along, you should have, you know, there's an aspect of you should have done your due diligence already but try to ask for some of that early enough that you can make an, a well-informed decision. I, I think um, uh, broadening the conversation a little bit, because I think we're, we're probably quickly talking about being on publicly traded companies. Mm -hmm. And um, y you know, the private equity world is, is probably not a bad place to kind of start for many people to jump on a board, because they might have a relationship or they might have a, sp a specific connection to a, to a company. And, and there, what you want to really understand is what's the investment thesis? When did the private equity firm jump into it? You, you know, who is the lead partner? Uh, what's the current valuation of the company? You know, you get, a, get a hold of the document they use to get approval at the investment committee level. And you'll get, you know, just a great overview to understand what's the goal here as opposed to you stepping in midway and trying to figure out, you know, what was the original investment thesis and what's the thoughts on kind of uh, exit, which I think is very, very important uh, in, the, in those situations. Okay. Let, me, let me ask one more question as a follow-up, and then I'm going to open it up to the, to the floor. So uh, the, another question I get is, should, does it help me to get on a public company board if I'm either on a nonprofit board or on a private, private company board? Um, do you have any, any thoughts on, on those issues in terms of advice to people? I think the most helpful thing to get on a public company board is to be on a co public company board, which is really an unhelpful comment, but <laughs> it's true. So then, okay, what's the next best? I would say a 
private equity board. Mm -hmm. Below that would be a venture capital back board, right. and below that would be a not-for-profit. Mm -hmm. And if you think of it vice versa as a progression, it's fine to start with a nonprofit, but you probably need to work you know, up to one of the other two before, perhaps before being able to be fully considered for a public board. And I would say that your own personal experience should help you figure out which one of those really makes sense for you. If you've run a large P&L or if you've been a, C or a sitting CEO, it may elevate you to be able to jump right into a public company situation. But if you're not that, that seated CEO, I think one of the most powerful things is in your life, in your professional experiences, who is extremely an extremely influential person that you know, that knows you, that would speak for you? Because people will look at your background and, and they will look for those people who have a strong voice because while the recruiters have a lot of influence, it is that informal system that really is extremely still very powerful in board candidate um, opportunities and selection. So it's, it's knowing where you might slot in, but also who are those key influencers that can help you when you get that call. Yeah, I think that's right. Lee, you can keep me, on, uh, me honest about this, but it does appear to me that in the last two years, at least from the small data points of mm -hmm. people who've called me, that recruiters are getting, are the, 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 the companies looking for board members are more open to people who are not at CEO level or have not been on a board previously, because you know they'll call me and I'll say, right now I'm 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 boarded up, but uh, I'd like to help you with the search. And as we go through the conversation, they are very clear that uh, it doesn't have to be one of those two things. Is that is that a correct it's statement? A, no, that's absolutely right. And yeah. I think it is a, a function that uh, well, there's a couple of things. One, CEOs can no longer sit on four or five boards. Right. <laughs> it's yeah. not. You know the institutional investment community is just not allowing that, so so the, the, their capacity is as as lower. But I also think, as we talked about, I mean the the focus on diversity and looking at people. We see it either with people who are earlier in their careers. Um, we've placed people on boards in their in their 30s. And you, you never would have seen that before, and uh, and absolutely. Um, uh, First time, first time uh, board members. We just put a, you know, a fabulous woman on a, you know, a Fortune 200 board who's going to just do, you know, in her 40s, who's going to be absolutely fantastic. Um, so I think there's a lot more receptivity. I think the worry that boards have, and I think they're getting much more comfortable with it, is that somebody who hasn't been on a board before you know, won't understand how to behave and will they try to act too much as management and, and all the worries. And, and the more times that we place uh, first time board members who do really well, I think that, I think there's a much greater receptivity uh, to different kinds of people. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. I would, I would say as a, as a chairman at Sensionix that um, the outside institutional shareholder voting groups like ISS are definitely looking at this and, and putting, in my mind, appropriate pressure on boards to push towards diversity, and that's creating the demand. Yeah. And then the, the pool of candidates, particularly gender diversity candidates, not as robust, and so therefore, you're more willing to say, hey, I'll take someone who this is their first board or kind of a, a development situation or isn't a sitting CEO, but they look like the division president and the heir apparent. Um, and so I think that cycle is, is working. Uh, the last thing I would, I would add to what Lee said is, um, if you join a board for the first time, um, discuss with the chairman an onboarding process if they're not discussing it with you. And so what I do for anybody who joins the board who maybe it is their first board and you are concerned that they're gonna try to be management and some other things, which by the way is a skill. It, it takes a while for you to let go of the steering wheel. Um, I can tell you I'm a better board member now than I was on my first board. I, I know that that's true and people tolerated me and that's great. Um, but um, <laughs> to pick someone on the board as, as a specific mentor, and so for a new board member, we, you know, every meet, after every meeting, we have that mentor talk to the board member and debrief and have a discussion with them and sort of quickly have them kind of onboarded as, as best and as productively as possible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, let me open it up. Any questions? Hi. I don't know if this is on or not. 
Yeah. No, it's not on. Okay. Was it on? Uh, <laughs> Hi. Um, can you guys talk a little bit more, Steve, you were just touching on this, about how do you draw the line between uh, acting in a managerial capacity versus a board member capacity? And when do you push your agenda forward? And when do you sit back and play more of a coach role? Well, I'll, I'll um, add some advice to this uh, that was given to me and, and in terms of a framework to think about your role as a director. And that is nose in, fingers out. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and so it, it really does you know, kind of just put it out there. You are not running the company. You are not management. So you've got to elevate yourself, get 30,000 feet up, and really use your experience and your intuition and your knowledge to ask those questions instead of predicting and you know, carrying it all the way down. So keep your questions simple and high level, and then probe once you get an answer. You can probe again, but you really have to practice this thing. And I think to Steve's point, it takes time to, to master this, but it starts from the principle of nose in, fingers out. Mm -hmm. Another framework, which is the same thing, but it helped me, was someone said, you're asking the good questions. You don't have to provide the answers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but also just get ready to forgive yourself. I think everybody's first year, I know I, ste I, I definitely stepped over the line a few times and people bore with, with it knowing you're a first time uh, board director. It, it happens because you're so used to what you do in your day job that it's uh, a little hard to adjust. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the other thing I'd add is um, a, a way to split the difference a little bit because I think I think all of this is a good advice and reflective, is you actually might have specific experience in some challenge that they're doing. They're, you know, they're, they're launching their product in Denmark, and, and, and you used to be the person who managed Denmark for, in your previous career or something. And, and, and there must be some, something that's very specific. And then the, the thing is, don't tell the story in the boardroom, <laughs> right? And just say to the person, Listen, I have some specific experiences there. Uh, sounds like what you're doing is on the right track, but why don't you give me a call after the board meeting? And that's really your opportunity to connect a little one-on-one, -on -one, do a little coaching, you know, maybe share a contact or an experience, but I keep it out of the boardroom, because when board members start telling their life stories, um, <laughs> yeah, you get off agenda quick. Um, well, you, know, you know, and I'll also add to that, you know, as a new board member, Look at what's happening around you. Look at the kinds of questions your colleagues who have the experience are asking, and you'll start to say, you know, I really like the way this person does it or that person, and it'll help you frame up the kinds of questions that you want to bring up in the boardroom. Hi. Um, what advice would you give to a company uh, owner, founder, CEO, if they're looking to establish a board for the first time? Uh, to establish a board for the first time. Oh. Well, you know, every board uh, opportunity that I've seen um, came with a job description that talked about the company and what the company's goals and objectives were. And then they would say, you know, these are the kinds of skills that we're, we're looking to bring on. And then what I've also seen is here's a list of be personal behaviors and attributes. Because what boards are, I think, moving away from is maybe iconic board members that either don't come prepared or they you know, take over the conversation or they don't know when not to speak or um, there have just been some people that I have been the replacement of and I was told, hey, we're so glad you're here. You're not the person that you know, kind of sidetracks the whole board discussion. So I think um, it, it needs to be a very thoughtful, the nominating and governance committee usually has the responsibility, but if you don't have a first board, you're gonna need that kind of input to define what skills you want to be contributing to the performance and, 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 and um, success of the company at the board level. So you've gotta have these written uh, attributes and skills that you're looking for. And, and I would say, you know, you know, if, if you're the CEO, the company is a relatively new company that's growing, you know, where do you think you're gonna need you know, help and support. I mean, that should be the, the, the biggest driver. What kinds of things, and you know, if you've got challenges, you're trying to, you know, expand into a different channel, who's gonna help me 
you know, get there and think, it, think about it from that perspective. I mean, ultimately, the board is there uh, to, to support the CEO and, and her or his you know, agenda and, until such point as the board decides that the CEO is not the right person. But until that point, that's, that's, the, that's the role of the board, is to really guide and help. So. I had a question. Um, so for those of us who aren't on a board but ultimately would like to be on a board, uh, how can we get ourselves educated? What's the best way to prepare ourselves to, besides obviously our industry background, but to prepare ourselves to be a board member? If, if you are able to, and it will depend on you know, what type of company you work for and so on, um, you know, one, one of the things that is almost a, a, a must have sometimes for many boards is some sort of uh, P&L experience. So if you have the opportunity to do that, even if it's just an assignment or reverse assignment from what I did where maybe you're in a corporate role, but you, know, you take a small business in addition or for a couple of years, uh, perhaps you know, one of the examples this morning that, uh, that was given about a joint venture, maybe volunteer to have something to do with that. If, if you're not able to do that, another, another useful area is M&A. You know, most companies today are really trying to grow through acquisition as well as organic growth. So having, having knowledge there, business development and M&A is useful. What you're trying to prove is that you know how sh total shareholder return, right? That you know how to, how to bring that to the table, help the CEO bring that to the table. So I, I would say those are some of the things to do. And I would say, um, to piggyback on what Ruby said, is um, if you are in a P&L role today, that's great. If you're not in a P&L role and you look at a board opportunity, you need to speak as if you're in the P&L role. And I don't mean to falsify your resume at all, but I was just uh, coaching a young person um, who uh, you know, had a great career in HR and they're looking at a board position. But when I looked at the top of their resume, it was like HR chief for a 2,000 person organization, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, 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 you're part of the senior team that over the past five years has doubled the value of that company as you've expanded into eight new markets. That's what goes on the top of your resume. And then you happen to be playing the role as the chief human research officer, but you're part of that executive team that did that. You need to just speak that language, right? And so I, I think as, as Lee was saying, um, there are more opportunities than the CFO, CEO job, but there's not opportunities for people who are not looking at it as an enterprise and, uh, and building value as an enterprise and able to use that vocabulary as they present themselves. Yeah. No, I would absolutely, I'd absolutely support that. We are placing people. We just put a CHRO um, on a, of a substantial company on a, on a, also on a substantial board. But, but she really did speak the language of the business. So if, I, I couldn't endorse that more. I don't think you need to have a, a, you know, a p and L. You can, you can speak it from your perspective of being in, a, in the top executive ranks, but it's important to present you're a strategic business of, you know, thinker and advisor and not a functional leader. In, in terms of just, I don't know if your question was also about education. I mean, there are, you know, whether it's NACD and other organizations, um, some of the accounting, you know, the accounting consulting firms have very good programs in terms of here's what here's what the, the nuts and bolts of governance. I mean, just to, just so you can get more comfortable in terms of the nomenclature and what the issues are, how committees work, all those kinds of things. So there's some very good programs out there as well. Hi, am I on? Okay. Um, so a couple of you have referenced how much work a board is. Would you be willing to share a little bit of the facts and figures about how many pages of material do you get every month? How far in advance? Like, how many days do they really give you to read them? How often do you get called to an emergency request, an extra meeting? Those kinds of things. What should people really expect about the work? Well, I serve on three very different boards, from eBay, Silicon Valley, to Raytheon in the defense industry, and um, I find that um, both are effective. Both are not necessarily the same level of efficiency. <laughs> um, and for Raytheon, um, it's, I serve on two committees, um, and I probably consume close to 1,000 pages 
of material. Um, and we get it all prepared when, when you're given a, usually a week in advance, not more than a week, but a week in advance to comb through that material. I always reserve my weekends before a board meeting to make sure I'm not you know, committing to something that takes a significant amount of time because of that. On eBay, what I've found is that they don't provide as much, it's very focused, but it'll come in dribs and drabs. You may not get the, C, the CFO's report until two days before. Um, and there may be an update that you want to read the night before to check to see what's in. But, um, but they're culturally very different, so you have to be comfortable with, with those two approaches. In terms of phone calls uh, or you know, extra work, um, Raytheon was, um, for six months, we were talking about a significant merger of equals with United Technologies. That meant a lot more work and, and, and a very sensitive period of time because you really cannot take any notes. When Lee said you're, you're potentially liable, mm -hmm. there will be shareholder suits whenever there is a significant M&A event. There are attorneys who are hired on behalf of the board to help guide us through that process so that we do not do anything that would put us at risk. But that meant more meetings, more follow-ups. We had secret meetings in different cities where we had to book our own travel because we didn't want, any, we didn't want the situation to leak. Um, and sometimes they have to be flexible. On my birthday, I was on a phone call at 5 a.m. because I didn't make the trip to the East Coast uh, to do a final vote on this merger. So you find that um, you have to be flexible when big things are happening in your boards and um, uh, they try to be flexible with the board but sometimes it goes on even if you can't make a particular call. But it, it can be a, a big thing. One of my boards meets uh, four times a year with a phone call. One meets five, six times a year with no extra planned phone call but there will always be extra calls. And then the committees, the committees, if you're on an audit committee, you're going to definitely have probably two meetings per cycle in addition to the other, the, the formal meetings because you're gonna have an audit committee meeting and usually there's a, a meeting to review the 10K before it gets filed. So there are extra efforts and that's why audit committees tend to get uh, a little bit more compensation than the others. So you still wanna be on a board. <laughs> uh, it's one, work. One more question. So just a follow-on question from the, the woman there who had the question about the early stage startups. You know, it's so important early on that you have a diverse skill set and you might not have the funds to be able to afford um, someone with um, a history necessarily as, as big of a network or as big of a skill set as you would necessarily like. So just, I'd love your advice on how do you go about attracting these people at an early stage, either as advisors, uh, board of advisors or board of directors. Um, so I, I think, um, I guess it, it piggybacks on the, if you're a CEO, how do you set the board up, right? And, and I think it's, it's getting the right combination of saying, where do I want to be in five years? Let me get that person with those skills on my board, right? And then combination with what is the work I have to do tomorrow? Um, and, and getting the people with those skills on the board, right? And so um, matching that up and then leveraging heavily your network to kind of talk to many, many people about who's good at that, right? And so if you have a product and you're launching it and it's a, it's a consumer product and you're gonna start in North America, all right, I, I wanna get someone on the board who's, you know, whatever, had a career as a product manager at P&G or something like that. Like, I need, I need to get that kind of skill on my board, uh, but, you know, we need to raise two more rounds of venture capital-backed funding. I, I wanna get a CFO who is in a VC-backed company and did this three times, right? And so, Kind of, in my mind, mapping out the work you got to do and saying, okay, how do I start to plug those people on the board? Um, smaller is better earlier. Board. Uh, yeah, because then you can add mm -hmm. uh, as you need to go. Uh, the larger the board, the more work for the CEO, hmm. right? So it takes uh, both, uh, Adrian was talking about her side of receiving 1,000 pages. You know, there's a lot of care and feeding when you're the CEO for each board member also. And so... Small so you can stay agile. Um, most small companies pivot at some point. They don't do exactly what they said they were gonna do because they figure something out somewhere in the market. Being able to add a board member li later is good flexibility you wanna have. Okay. I would add that advisory boards um, as well as the board is a way that maybe you can get someone in where they are more influential but they really don't have the time but that the CEO 
can give a phone call when they're dealing with something very particular through a relationship. That's a nice way to supplement that early, that early phase. Well, terrific. Thank you so much for your thoughtfulness. Thank you. Thoughtfulness. Thank you. <laughs>